Let's go to session number three. I'm going to talk about overcoming. And uh, what we want to really focus on in this session is to understand God's provision for you and me as believers to live victorious. So we saw the call to godliness or holiness in the previous session. And what we want to understand is that God has made provision for all of us. It's just the same provision that all of us have access to. By which we can live victorious over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and all the battles that we face. I know that today we have um, intentionally focused on one aspect of our battles having to do with our character, our life. Of course, there are other battles, you know, financial challenges, family challenges, or other challenges that we have in life. Um, but we are focusing more on things that affect our character, how we live, godliness. And so we want to just remind us about the provision that God has made. We know, and I'm, I'm, I'm in session 3, page 11, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. We know the, the futility of, or the vanity, the emptiness of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The Bible tells us, you know, verse 17, the world is passing away and all the lusts. I mean, these things are just going to pass away. They're not eternal. They're not lasting. They're not worth pursuing. The world is passing away and all the lusts. But he who does the will of God endures forever. So doing the will of God, that's the enduring thing. That's the thing that's going to matter for eternity. These other things are going to go away. So, we want to look at God's provision. What has God provided for us? Second, Corinthians, Second Peter, sorry. Second Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. The Bible tells, Peter says very clearly that God, by his divine power, he's given to us. Notice the past tense. He's given to us. It's not we're going to persuade him to give. He's already given. He's given to us everything we need for life and godliness. So God has already made provision for you and me, everything we need to live this life and godliness, to live a life of godliness. So he gave us a call, come to godliness, but he's also given us a provision. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtues. The fact that you came to know him and you came into this relationship with him, you now have access to this. You have access to his provision for life and godliness. And what would be the outcome? Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That means God has made this wonderful promises, his word available to us, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So he's saying, look, I've given you my precious promises, so you can partake of divine nature. Just think of that. That you and I can express the very nature of God, divine nature. You and I are partakers of divine nature, so our life has got to be an expression that we are partakers of divine nature. That through these, you might be partakers of divine nature and escape the corruption, the moral degradation that is in the world because of lust or ungodly desires. So you and I can escape. So we are in this world. There is corruption that is moral corruption around us. But we escape that. We live free from it. We live uh, victorious against it. We can escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So I want us to understand God's made that provision for you and me. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. 
Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So that's a warning for us. Walk cautiously. But verse 13 is the encouragement. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. It's every man's battles. Not the only one, as we heard in first session. All of us have to go through it. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So in every temptation that you and I face, there is a way of escape. There is a way out. We don't have to stay trapped. Oh God, I'm trapped. In. No, 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 no. There's a way out. God will make the way out. He says, he will make a way for you and me to escape. So we don't have to, you know, be trapped. There beyond what we can bear. So there is that way, and we want to understand how to take that way of escape and live victorious against those temptations. So this, this, this session uh, may be a little heavy you know, in the word, but I want us to understand that's where our victory comes from, God's word. Okay? And I'm going to be quick because we just have 30 minutes, so literally compressing maybe what will take us 30 hours in 30 minutes. But this is very important for us to know. The first very important thing to know is God's provision is that on the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin. Now, I remember a long, and I've, probably you've heard me share this story, but way back as a, as a teenager, um, I must have been about 14 or 15 at that time. Uh, and we were part of the Methodist Church, Richmond Town, so I have just blessed memories of being part of that church. But that was a time when I was really saying, God, what is the key to holiness? What is the key to live holy, to live victorious? I remember spending a lot of time there in that Methodist Church in Richmond Town uh, on Saturdays, on the weekend, on Saturday. Every Saturday I'd go there, and I would just be studying the scriptures. Uh, those days we didn't have, you know, obviously we didn't have mobile phones to go through many versions. So I literally had to keep different versions of the Bible in front of me and to read. And I was searching for the answers. And I came upon Romans 6, 7, 8. And so I read Romans 6, 7, and 8 from every version, trans, you know, English version, trying to understand. And Romans 6 just began to open up to me. And that was the secret. That was the key. And I understood that on the cross, the power of sin over our lives was broken. And the key verse is Romans 6, 6. It says, you know, there's a new King James, says, knowing this, you need to know this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin, the power of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. But this is the key. On the cross, when Jesus died, your old man was crucified. That sinful nature inside of, or if you want to refer to it as, what we got through Adam was put to death. Adam's nature, the old man, the old sinful nature was crucified on the cross with Jesus Christ. So that we should no longer be slaves of sin. This is Bible truth. You are no longer a slave of sin. And it says in verse 7, he who has died is freed from sin. So in one sense, you and I are dead people. The Adam in us was crucified. The Adam's nature was crucified. And you and I are free from sin. So this, getting this, embracing this truth is your first step to a life of victory. That sin has no power over me. And that's why he says in verse 14, sin will not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Under law, God gave the commandments, but there was no provision to live victorious. Under grace, yes, there is the commandment, but there is also the provision that God gave. So that's grace. He did the work and he says, now you walk in it. I took care of the old man. I destroyed the old man. Now you walk free from sin. So that's the key. The knowing that, you know, you don't have a sinful nature. You don't have Adam's nature. Yes, we have the, to deal with the flesh. And he's given us means to overcome the flesh and renew our mind. But sin has no power over you. You are free from sin. And a picture that I'd like to use is, you know, you think of a person who's a drunkard, who's an alcoholic. If he dies, you know, imagine he's dead. 
you place all his favorite drinks around him he's not even going to move his little finger he's dead and that's how you and i are we're dead to sin so it begins with that embracing this truth sin has no dominion over me so you call sin by its name if it's pornography if it's anything else whatever you call it by its name whatever the area of battle might be call it by its name and so you do not have dominion over me finished because the work was done on the cross the power of sin over my life was broken the power of sin over your life was broken sin has no dominion over you so that's understanding the finished work of the cross second page 12 god's given us his word so the word is a cleansing and it's also meant for warring it's for washing and for warring so we renew our mind with the word of god and you put god's word in your mind that's why it's so important for each of us to personally read the bible you know uh don't we can't tell hey you read the bible for me <laughs> doesn't work each one of us we have to read the bible you have to put the word of god in because you and i individually we need the word of god to wash us and it's the word that we use to fight right so you take god's word as and fight with the word of god it's the sword of the spirit which is the word of god john 15:3 it cleanses us you are clean by the word i've spoken to you right so our minds we understand the biggest battle is in our minds our minds have been corrupted by all the things we hear we need our minds cleaned out how do you clean out by the word right so you constantly read the word and you clean out your mind displace those wrong thinking displace those lustful thoughts Dis- displace get rid of all that wrong evil ungodly thoughts from the mind you know literally our brains need washing because they are so dirty somebody says you your brain washes yeah my brain really need a lot of washing <laughs> i just use the word of god to wash it you know cleanse it it's clean now by the word so yes i am brainwashed by the word of god if you want to you know use that but yeah we clean by the word and we use that same word to war against uh the temptations the enemy bring enemy brings and number 3 is the holy spirit the holy spirit is the one who gives us the strength to overcome so learn to depend on the holy spirit when temptation comes knocking at the door you holy spirit give me the strength to overcome so what are we supposed to do with the help of the holy spirit romans 8 verse 13 he says if you live according to the flesh you'll die if you live yielding to the desires of the flesh you will die but by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body so holy spirit i want to put an end to this sinful deed i want to put an end to this sinful habit i want to put an end to this sinful attitude i want to put an end to this sinful temperament whatever it is by the spirit you put to death that aspect of your being right so the holy spirit helps you to put an end to it so in your nature you have you're a partaker of divine nature sinful nature has been done away with now you got to get your mind and your body aligned to that divine nature mind renew with the word of god body put to death the sinful deeds by the power of the holy spirit so we need to do that god's made the provision holy spirit is there now we need to join together join forces with the spirit and do it so look at galatians 5 and again these are all just summaries each of these areas you can delve with in in depth he says walk in the spirit you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh very simple statement but so powerful you walk in the spirit that means you walk influenced governed dominated under the influence of the holy spirit you won't give in to the flesh so what happens we are living in this world there are all kinds of things around us and the devil comes to tempt us and there are all these things they pull on our flesh they pull on the natural evil desires of our flesh but if you're living 
under the Holy Spirit. You're walking in the Spirit. He says you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Will you feel the pull of the flesh? Of course. But you won't live. You won't yield to it. Because you're walking in the Spirit. Yield it to Him. So moment by moment, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me to overcome. The moment you feel the pull of that temptation, lean to the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, help me. Give me wisdom. Show me what to do. How do I respond? And he's going to help you. And he says in verse 24, those who are Christ's, so he's talking about you and me, we have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So one sense, we are dead people walking. In the spirit, we are alive, but our body is dead. It's crucified. So that's who believers are. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and desires. So, threefold provision. One is the cross. The power of sin was broken. Two things, the word of God and the Holy Spirit. The word which we renew our mind, and the word which we use as a boring weapon against the enemy, and the Holy Spirit. He crucified, helps us crucify the flesh. And if we walk yielded to him, we won't give in to the flesh. So every day, Holy Spirit, fill me. Or throughout the day, we may pray again, Spirit of God, just fill me. Oh God, just take all my emotions, take all my desires, take all my appetites. You're living, you're always being under his influence, under his leadership. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? So, how do we work this out? How do we apply this, right? Practically, how do we live victorious of our sexual addiction, desire for money, fame, control, and other areas? You know, and, and, and you know, I'm not dealing with so much of the, you know, the, the scenarios because there's so many scenarios where we will face these battles. But let's look at the solution. Number one, it's the fear of God, right? We have to walk in godly fear all the time. This is, I'm not saying, you know, some, for some reason in, in, in the contemporary church, um, the fear of God has, is downplayed. We don't talk too much about it. We want, you know, we want, yes, we, we need to bring grace. Uh, and grace, understanding grace is so important. It's so liberating. Understanding God's love is so wonderful. Uh, it's so healing. It's wonderful. But we shouldn't do it at the expense of forgetting the reverence, the fear of God. We need to keep it in balance. Keep it together. That there has to be a godly fear in our hearts. There has to be that. And, and you know, a great example is Joseph. I mean, he's here in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's given everything in charge and he's being tempted by Potiphar's wife, being seduced. He's got every opportunity, but there's one thing with which he stands. He says in Genesis 39, he says, verse 9, There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So that's Joseph's, how can I sin against God? What's holding you back, Joseph? What's keeping you back? How can I do this sin? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Meaning, I'm, I'm going to be answerable to God. It's not just Potiphar. It's not just man. But there's a God in heaven that I have to answer to. So you can imagine, there was this godly reverence, godly fear in his heart. I have to answer to God. Even if a, a single soul on earth doesn't observe, doesn't watch. Forget it. I have to answer to God. That was in his heart. Are you all with me? Just make sure your neighbors are awake. <laughs> I have to answer to God. From 16.6, it says, In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. God took care of that. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. By the fear of the Lord, 
It's godly fear that's going to keep us away from evil. Proverbs 23, 17. Don't let your heart envy sinners. Be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. That means throughout the day. Keep yourself in the fear of God. You know, don't look at you know, all the sinners. They seem like they're having a party. They seem like they're having a nice time. Oh, but you keep yourself in the fear of God. So it's this reverence for God that's going to keep us in a place of refusal to sin and a repentant heart towards God. The moment something goes wrong, you're going to turn to God. Repentance. Secondly, how do you apply this? Is consecration. Clean house. So you consecrate. You intentionally come before God. Say, God, I bring all of my passions, my appetites, my desires, my ambitions. I am consecrating it to you. I'm purposefully bringing it before you. So you pray over yourself. You speak God's word over yourself. You talk to God. Father, in Jesus' name, I consecrate all my appetites, all my desires, all my imaginations, all my you know, dreams, all my everything about me. I consecrate it to you. Because the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, you are the temple of God. So you're holy. So you look at every part of you as holy. God, every part of me is holy. It's consecrated to God. And 1 Corinthians 6 is dealing with the whole, the whole aspect of sexual immorality. It says flee sexual immorality. Because why? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So look at your body as sacred ground. Amen? Look at every part of you as sacred ground, as holy. Others may not think like it. You think. I am God's temple. Every part of me, spirit, soul, body is God's dwelling place. Every part of me is holy. It's consecrated God. So you bring it there. When bad thoughts, unclean thoughts want to fill your mind, you say, no, mind, my mind is holy ground. It's not a place for ungodly thoughts. When you're tempted to get into this realm of, you know, uh, immoral fantasies. No, no, no. My mind is holy. My imagination is holy. Every part of me is sacred. You consecrate it to God. So, clean house. Keep it clean. When you are going to watch something, listen to something. If it's unclean, sorry. No, no place. This is God's temple. No place. Not through my eyes, not through my ears. No entry. This is temple. This is holy ground. So you're practicing this. You are the temple of God. You're consecrating day-to-day -day basis. You know, and, and, and so, so much of this happens unintentionally. You know, you're watching some thing on YouTube, very, <laughs> whatever. You might even be watching Sunday morning live stream. And here you have this <laughs> algorithm doing its work and it's presenting some strange thing, totally unrelated. Usually it'll be related, but sometimes something else comes up. And your eyes fall on it. Say, no. You bounce your eyes off. Take it off. You don't land your eyes there. You don't settle it. Bounce it off. Because this is temple. This is holy ground. I'm not going to pay attention. It may, it may be served to me. I'm not accepting it. So every part of you stays consecrated. Number three, we need to renew our minds. So we are, we are applying the God's provision. To renew our mind is to change our way of thinking. Instead of thinking according to the world, we think according to the word. Instead of thinking according to the world, we take on God's thoughts and God's ways. It's an intentional switch. It's a reprogramming of our mind. And you renew your mind with the word of God. What does God's word say? So you're intentionally thinking, what does the Bible say at this moment? For instance, you, you know, uh, maybe in an office and, you know, maybe there's a very attractive lady sitting, you know, right across. Now, the natural way is your eyes want to feast. On her beauty, whatever. But then that moment you think the word. Think the word. 
Instead of letting your eyes wander and lust and engage all the wrong. No, think the word. And that's why it's important to put the word of God in your heart. Yeah. So you, you use scriptures. Proverbs 6.25 Do not lust after her beauty in your heart. So the moment your eyes go and uh, you can say, thank God, thank you, she's beautiful. That's fine. But don't go beyond that. You're recognizing beauty. You're appreciating beauty. Stop. Full stop. <laughs> beyond that. No. Because God's word. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart. You can appreciate, but don't lust. Proverbs 31.3 do not give your way to your ways to kings. Not to the, not give your ways to kings. Not to your ways to that which destroys men. So, I won't give myself. You know, Job, forty, verse two. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think lustfully about a woman? Then you go Matthew five, twenty eight, twenty nine. Jesus said, "Whoever looks at a woman to lust after her." has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So these are scriptures. You just bring it to your mind. The moment those lustful thoughts come, counter it with the word. I'm just giving one example. But you do this in every area of your life. You're renewing your mind. You're intentionally thinking according to God's ways and God's thoughts instead of thinking according to the ways of the world. You're with me? Right. So we have to do that. We have to renew our mind. And when you start doing that, at some point, this becomes your default response. That means you don't even have to force the response. The moment you're in that situation, this is how you'll start thinking. You know, Pastor Jacob talked about the railroad, you know, how we form those grooves in our brains. But initially, you have to do it purposefully, intentionally. After some time, it becomes your normal response. In any area of your life, that'll be the way. When there's temptation, the scriptures will come. That's how you will think. Your mind is renewed. And Romans 12 tells us, you know, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So that transformation in our life is going to take place through this renewed mind. Think according to God's word. Number 4, page 14, number 4, is to pray. We pray for two reasons. One, to be on guard and for strength to overcome. You know, the Bible tells us to be sober, to be vigilant. Because our adversary, the enemy, is like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. That means you're always on guard. Always alert. Be alert, be vigilant, be watchful. So as you're going through life, you have to always think. and. Now, I've said this before. You're, you're thinking like, what will, the, what will the devil try to do to knock me out? It's almost like you're thinking, like the enemy. What will the devil do to knock me out? So you're saying, okay, I know my areas of weakness. Obviously, he's going to come in areas of my weakness. So I will be on double guard on my areas of weakness. Because the Bible said, be sober, be. Which, so you ask yourself the question. What will the devil do to knock me out? What will the devil do if he wants to neutralize me? If he wants to uh, stop me in what I'm doing? What would he do? So you're, you're, you're kind of understanding his battle plans. And then you're praying. You're being watchful in those areas. You know, Paul tell, told us, 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, We are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of the, the Satan's schemes, how he operates. So we can be preemptive. So you pray preemptively. Father, I pray that you'll strengthen me in this area. Father, I pray that you'll protect me in this area. So you're praying. You make this a part of a prayer. That's what Jesus meant. He said, you pray. Lead us not into temptation. If you want to paraphrase that, pray preemptively that you don't get into that place of temptation. You're stopping it even before it happens. So, pray. And then, you also pray for strength to overcome. So when, the temp when there is that temptation, when there is those battles that are raging, God give me the strength to overcome. 
Number five is to resist. How do you resist? So the Bible tells us, you know, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. How do you resist? One, we resist by speaking the word. So three times, you know, in the temptations of Jesus, when the devil came, each time Jesus responded by saying, it is written. Devil, take the word. This is what the Bible says. So you speak the word. The words are sword. You put it out there. So when temptation comes, no, this is what the Bible says. Speak it with your mouth. So that's one way of resisting. Another way of resisting is to close the door. That means you don't even give the devil an opportunity. So keep the door closed. The Bible tells us Romans 13, 14. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't give the flesh any opportunity. So that's how I'm resisting. How? The door is closed. I'm not waiting for the devil to come and knock. The doors are closed. So you make no provision. Example. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, you, you have to find what works for you. But for example, when I'm traveling, and okay, I have to stay in some hotel somewhere, I don't even turn on the TV. I make no provision. So forget it. There's no, I'm not watching anything. Even if I have free time, I don't turn on the TV. There's no, I make no provision. So, but how do you get your news? I, I have BBC up here. <laughs> so I get my news from, you know, some sources that I use. So I make no provision. For example, I never meet with a lady alone. So ladies, you want to come meet me? You meet me in the church office. It's all glass. Everybody sees you're there. So nothing can happen. Everybody knows who's coming in. Everybody knows who's going out. So I, I make no provision. There's no chance. And I remember once I walked into a, and I'm not saying this in a, you know, to put somebody down, but I went into a pastor's office. It's all wooden. And I've seen many, at least two pastor's offices, all wooden doors, everything. And I, I was like, man, I would never sit in an office like this. Why? Because if a lady enters and you close the door, who knows what's happening inside? Terrible. But these are pastor's offices. And I said, I will never enter an office like this. I mean, sit in an office like this. Because this is so dangerous. Because people are coming to you. They're coming to you in their moments of weakness. They're coming to you with their problems. And that's a very vulnerable time in their lives. And that's why when we, we set up our office, I said, everything glass, including counseling room, everything glass. We don't want anything to come. So we make no provision. It's all intentional. You're thinking like that. Give no opportunity. I never travel with a lady alone in the car except my wife or family member. Never. So what if they're dying on the road? God, send your angel, take care of them. Not me. <laughs> That's it. Finished. Because, you know, I mean, I might help in that situation, but <laughs> I don't know. But normally, you know, don't think I'm hard out of like this. <laughs> what a past to be. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is I'm really strict about this. Really strict. Why? That's one way of resisting. You keep the door closed. Don't make, don't give an opportunity. That's it. No opportunity. So yes, the door is closed. Three, stay within your boundaries. Right? That means uh, you need to know when to say no. Proverbs 11, 10, Proverbs 1, 10. My, sinner, my son, if sinners entice you, don't consent. Somebody invites you? No, thank you. You know they're inviting you for something wrong? No, thank you. I have my boundaries. I, I keep myself in there. Stay there. Um, Proverbs 3 7. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. First Thessalonians 5 22, abstain from every form of evil. So you should stay within your boundaries. Stay within it. So this is, you are self governing, and that's a fruit of the Spirit, right? One of the fruit of the Spirit, self control. Or put it another way, the ability to be self governing. It's an empowering the Holy Spirit gives you and me to govern ourselves. 
Keep yourselves within your boundaries. So when you walk in the spirit, you'll be self-governing. That's self-control. Right? Really your spirit control. But he's empowering you to govern yourself. So always stay within your boundaries. You don't cross those boundaries. And, num- and the fourth way to resist is to run. Right? Sometimes you have to run. And, and I, was just, I just did a little search in scripture. The Bible tells us to flee. To flee literally means run for your life. Vanish from the place. <laughs> Don't even hang out there. Don't even take one step back and keep staring. No, run. Flee. What kind of situations? And these are scriptures you can look at. It says flee from sexual immorality. Anything that is going to hit you in that area of your sexuality, run from it. Don't even stay there. Flee from idolatry, anything that wants to take the place of God. Run from that. Flee from the love of money, 1 Timothy 6, 10, 11. So anything that's going to cause you to come into that place of being controlled by money, run from it. Flee from youthful lust, 2 Timothy 2, 22. So these are things you don't play around with. You don't even try to touch it from a distance. Run from it. Run. Turn and run. It's not covetous. It's you. One way of resisting temptation is to run from it. Like what Joseph did. Right? So you don't even play around with it. No. Just run. Walk away. Run from it. And lastly, uh, we need to surround ourselves with godly people. That's why we encourage these kinds of things. We have men's breakfast meetings, which are smaller. We have life groups. We have these kinds of things. Why? Surround yourself with godly people who can encourage you. You can share your problems with. They can pray for you. Uh, You can call them up, support, you know, those things are there. So uh, have godly people to strengthen you, right? So practically, and I've gone through this very fast, but this is how we do it. We walk in the fear of God. We keep ourselves consecrated. And this is a prayer we pray all the time, over and over again. Lord, I consecrate my mind. I consecrate my emotions. Three, Renew our mind with the word. We pray and we resist. Whether it's speaking the word, keeping the door closed, stay within boundaries, run to safety, or godly association. Surround yourself with godly people. Now, I just want to make mention here about the church app. On the church app, we have a section on the toolkit. We have, you know, faith builders and other things where scriptures are listed on various topics, so you can use that you know, to you know, various things that you can search for and use the scriptures. I know I've gone a little over time. In the next 30 minutes, I want us to take some time to share in our tables, please. First, uh, uh, you can reflect on these, uh, your action, your personal action items. Uh, based on what we went through quickly in the session, write down some things that you would like to act upon. You know, for your own self. Hey, I need to work on these things. Just write at least three things you can think about. Then in the table discussions, we can share with each other. You know, how do we keep ourselves in the fear of God? Especially when we are in, surrounded in situations where the fear of God is minimized. Right? So nobody even thinks about it. How do we keep the reverence of God in our hearts? Second thing you can discuss is how do we practice resisting. Now we mentioned these four ways. How do you practice? I just talk about some real life scenarios or maybe some things that you've done. Uh, you know, I try to mention a couple of that I practice, but you can share some things of how you actually resist. And number three, you could share something that you may have learned new or came back to your fresh in this session. Then take some time to pray. Is that okay? Yeah? So please take some time to share with one another. And this is a time of learning where you can share, you know, from your own experience and bless others. Thank you.